So in the second part of the talk yesterday, we started merging the dynamical considerations of the first lecture with the kinematical considerations of the second and third. And we ended up with an interesting duality, which I write like that. where I suppressed the gravitational churn simons terms here. So let me remind you the notation. First of all, I'm in Euclidean signature here. Second, I mix notation. These two terms are forms, and these two terms are not forms. Otherwise, it will be much harder to write. So when time reversal acts, we'll have to remember that. Sec next thing, this theory on the left is the Wilson-Fisher theory, coupled to a gauge field B with a churn simons term level 1. This theory is the same Wilson-Fisher theory, coupled to a gauge field B hat, with a U1 level minus 1. So this theory looks like the time reversal image of that, which is a bit surprising, because this theory does not, uh, is not time reversal invariant, because it has a churn simons term, and yet it's dual to the theory with the opposite churn simons term. So this theory is really time reversal invariant in disguise. And the time reversal, and what this notation means, is that we are in the infrared. It's not true for the two-field theory. The two-field theory is this and that are not the same. But the infrared behavior is the same. And, sorry? Same terms. Uh, that should, should have been an A. Thank you. And it should be 2 pi. I think I made exactly the same mistake last time. Uh, no, it's correct in my notes. Um, so the two field theories are not the same. And what this notation means is that I tune both the left-hand side and the right-hand side to the infrared. So this is a statement only about the infrared. So the phi squared term is missing here and here. And the phi to the fourth term has coefficient 1, just to remind us that there was a phi to the fourth uh, to begin with. This is very surprising. It should be very surprising that we take a theory. So the Wilson-Fisher theory has been bitten to death for the last several decades, with and without the gauge field. And the only thing we say is that we add to it U1 churn simons term, level 1. And then this theory, so this theory, without everything, anything else, is time reversal invariant. That's obvious. The fact that this theory is time reversal invariant should be surprising. Not only is it surprising, when we look at this in more detail, when we set the classical background field A to 0, we have a surprising duality. But for non-zero A, it looks like the right-hand side is the T image of the left-hand side up to a shift like that, which we interpreted as an anomaly. So this theory is not quite time reversal invariant. There is a mixed anomaly between time reversal and the U1 symmetry of the classical gauge field A. So that's also surprising. We also discussed the operators both on the left and on the right. And we said that the theory has a spin a half operator with charge 1 under A, which is the magnetic monopole. It's charge 1, so I have to multiply that by phi dagger. So this operator on the left is dual to M dagger B from here. And it has charge minus 1, so I need to put phi hat dagger here, and that's with a hat. So both the theory on the left and on the right should better have the same operators. Otherwise, they would not be a dual to each other. But the operator, the, the main order parameter, the main operator, is an operator with charge 1 under the classical gauge field A, and it is a fermion. So this theory has an, the monopole operator is a fermion, and that's the order parameter. 
We also discussed the deformations of this theory. And the most interesting deformation was the mass term for the scalar, which, as in the Wilson Fisher, is a particle vortex duality. It's mapped with a minus sign. So if we turn on positive mass square here, that translates under the duality to turning on a negative mass square on the other side. And so there are four different calculations we have to do. Turning on positive mass square here, negative mass square here, positive mass square here, and negative mass square here, work out the spectrum and check <coughs> that the two sp the spectra exist, uh, the spectrum match. So first of all, the spectrum match, that's number one. Number two, there is a low energy dynamics that depending on the sign, is different, so the theory is gapped either way, but there is a classical term that remains. It comes under the name of SPT phase in the condensed matter literature. We would just say that the response to background field A is a little bit different in the two phases, and such a term of U1 level 1 for A is or is not present depending on which phase we are in. And we got the same answer in the two theories. Furthermore, the spectrum of the theory includes massive particles, and there were massive particles on both sides. So all, all four calculations give massive particle. And the massive particle is a fermion with spin plus a half on one side and with one sign of the mass square and spin minus a half with the other sign of the mass term. And therefore, we interpret the, say so that this operator phi, so this operator is T odd. So there is time reversal in the UV that exists if we ignore the churn simons term. This symmetry is gone. It's nowhere to be seen anymore. There's an emergent time reversal symmetry in the infrared. That's what this thing <laughs> is telling us. And then that, under that emergent time reversal symmetry, phi absolute value square is odd. And roughly speaking, phi is mapped to phi hat because it maps the fields from here to the fields here. So the emergent time reversal in the infrared acts non locally on the microscopic fields. But it's a symmetry in the infrared. So have we seen such a theory before with exactly this set of properties? We discussed it in great length in the lecture one and lecture two, and to some extent in lecture and in lecture three. This is exactly like the free fermion. So the claim is that <coughs> this theory, and to get the convention straight, I'll move the theory without the A. So the claim is that the free fermion Now, I'd like to make some comments about that. We didn't prove it, number one. There was a whole sequence of conjectures. And as we add more and more conjectures, of course, it's less and less reliable. So number one, we started with particle vortex duality. This was also kind of a conjecture. There was a lot of fine print with it. But there is huge body of evidence that this is right. So I view that as no question this is right. Then we did all these manipulations of adding the gauge fields, adding counter terms and gauging, and assuming that there's still a second order point. I view that as extremely likely. That's also true here. And then we ex look at this theory and its bizarre properties, and it looks exactly like the free fermions. In other words, at short distances, we look at this theory, there's a monopole operator, and we analyze the monopole operator carefully, and the monopole operator is a fermion, and it's a very high dimension operator. And as we go to the infrared, all we need to assume is that its dimension becomes one in the infrared such that it is a free fermion. That's the only assumption. And that assumption 
fits a lot of things and satisfies a lot of consistency conditions. For example, I can add here another term entry to the dual and say this is the mass term for the fermion. So this complicated scalar theory flows to a free fermion in the infrared. So in, in general, in quantum field theory, we formulate the question at short distances, and the answer is the long distance behavior. We have a renormalization group from the UV to the IR. In QCD, we start with quarks and gluons, and we end up with pions, baryons, etc. The claim here is that this interacting theory, the Wilson Fisher theory, coupled to a gauge field with a Chern Simons level one, which is a very complicated interacting theory, ends up being a theory of, a f of free fermions. And the massless free fermion at long distances started its life as a monopole operator at short distances. This is common in duality, that the monopoles on one side are the elementary fields on the other side. The novelty here is that we started with bosons and we ended up with fermions. Now, somebody could complain, could complain, look, started with bosons, this is a theory that doesn't need fermions, does not need spin structure, does not need all that. You ended up with a theory that needs a spin structure because you ended up with a fermion. How can that be? This seems to violate a, a tooth matching. But there are two answers to that. The less sophisticated answer is already this theory, because of this churn simons term with odd level, needs a choice of spin structure. So from this perspective, the puzzle it, it, it disappears because this theory is a bosonic theory, but it needs a choice of spin structure to carefully define this churn simons level one. But there's a deeper answer, and the deeper answer that actually if A is a spin C connection, we don't even need the spin structure here, because this combination was in the list of allowed combinations I gave you. And similarly, the free fermion theory does not need a, spin a choice of spin structure if A is a spin connection. So again, we landed on our feet. So to summarize that, uh, the statement for this duality is still an assumption. But the assumption is supported by manipulations that, first of all, we, there isn't an obvious contradiction. Second, in the two phases of the theory, when we deform either with positive mass or with negative mass for the fermion, we end up with a theory with or without the ADA term. That follows from the bosonic theory. Furthermore, this theory has only one relevant operator. And this theory appears to have only one relevant operator, at least as far as we can see in the UV. The spectrum of massive particles on the left-hand side is one fermion with spin plus a half on one side of the mass and minus a half on the for the other side of the mass. The same can be seen on this side of the duality. And we are going to assume that this is true. That's a different theory. What is the, is there, a there are, sometimes there is, and sometimes the duality is actually very interesting. But <coughs> this is a different question. So uh, the way I view it here is not looking for dualities, but I, I'll come to you. But we have various UV theories, and our goal is to identify the long distance behavior. That's our goal. And the theory without the with level zero, we discussed at length. This is the Gage Wilson Fisher theory. And with level one, it's a free fermion. With level two, there's another surprise. And if I get to it, I'll discuss it. And as we go up in the levels, the situation changes. And David asked me at some point, is it going to continue to be surprising as I increase the level? And my answer is that we don't know until we work it out. And I still stand behind this answer. I assume that if k is very, very large, it becomes simple. Actually, when k goes to infinity, this thing can be analyzed uh, at, in, at large k. But how large is large? Is 7 large enough? <coughs> I don't know. Question. So you said you started off with, with uh, bosons, but you showed us that, um, that we, we construct any on. Is that, that only that's because you chose a spin structure? No, I, I can construct, uh, construct any ions. In this case, I constructed the fermion. It was not, it's not a very exciting anion. Yeah. 
uh, but it is some kind of an anion, the fermion, which is already surprising. If you start with bosons, and the particles in the end of the day are fermions. And, but the, the, the engine behind it is the Chern Simon storm. So the Chern Simon storm has only one derivative, right? Yes. It doesn't, it doesn't appear to be bounded below. So if it's a boson. It has an I in Euclidean space. Sorry? It has an I in front of it in Euclidean space. And that makes it, that makes it bounded below? Well, it, <laughs> it's imaginary. So the, the e to the minus the action is bounded from below. It's bound from below from, yeah. And in Minkowski space, it's okay? In Minkowski space, the action is never bounded from below. Because you write the kinetic term minus the potential. So keep the, the scalar fields constant and go up the potential. The action it's goes. An and uh, well, in the functional integral, there's an i. But well, there's a question of what question you ask. The Hamiltonian, I mean, I can go to Minkowski space and then construct the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian is good. It's good? Yep. With one derivative? Yep. <laughs> So I'll leave it as an exercise for you. <laughs> so if you have just the Chern Simon term, I'll give you a clue. The Hamiltonian is zero. And you shouldn't be surprised because the theory is topological. So it should better be zero. This case is more interesting because the gauge field of the Chern Simon term also interact with scalar fields. It's the same B here and here. And therefore, it's a little bit more interesting. And that's why it can make produce free fermions. It's surprising, but the more you think about it, you, it's the less surprising it is. It's more interesting than bosonization in two dimensions. Because in two dimensions, operators can have fractional <laughs> half integer or integer spin, but the particles don't have spin. Massive particles don't have spin, and massless particles don't. In two plus one dimensions, there is spin for the operators. It's an SU2 representation. And there is spin for the particles. It's a U1 representation, or maybe multiple cover of U1. The surprise here is that we got half integer spin operators in two plus one dimensions. And even in the particles, we got them. So it's not that we found complicated fields to describe a uh, bosonic system. The system is, is really fermionic. Oh, if there's, I'll answer your question literally. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, if there's any chance, yeah, it's a, it's a small chance. But in supersymmetric theories, we've seen a lot of this. But there, you kind of have fermions to begin with. But honestly, I don't see why not. You know, whenever there's a, whenever, yeah, yeah, whenever there's a new element, yeah, whenever there's a new element, you always say, oh, yeah, you use special things. <laughs> I, my hunch, I don't see why not. So I, I can give you historical examples that you know very well. Other non-trivial fixed points of the renormalization group about, uh, above four dimensions. And of course, the answer is there's no chance because you start from free field theory, and you flow to the infrared. Then we learned that there was always some new element. And in hindsight, it's always quite obvious. Why didn't think we think about it before? And I don't see why there shouldn't be such a thing in four dimensions. So we've exhibited some tricks and shown some examples of how the tricks work. And now I think it's time to have fun with it, namely use the same set of tricks on many, many examples and find many more such surprising results. So the interest, the novelty here is that we started with an interacting theory in the UV and we ended up with a free theory in the IR. So that's what's special in this case. And this is the case this is a characteristic example of when duality is more, most interesting. We start from something interacting, and we know in the infrared we have a free field theory, and that's, since it's free, it's unambiguous what the degrees of freedom are, and so <coughs> forth. There are also other interesting dualities where both sides are interacting, but one of the interacting sides is a theory that we recognize and we know and we know a lot about. So I'm going to do that now. 
So the tricks will always be the same. I'll start with any one of these dualities. I will add some local counter terms, which depends on the background fields to both sides. So that's clearly kosher. And then I will promote one of these gauge fields to be dynamical. And on the blackboard, it's very easy. I just change the uppercase to lowercase. And then we had a bunch of tricks how to integrate out gauge fields. Like level 1 would be trivial if it does not couple to anything else. The off-diagonal 1x is a, is a Lagrange multiplier. We discussed all these tricks before. And this is how we'll manipulate both sides of the duality and hoping to land on something interesting. So I'm going to start with this duality. 6.3, let's make sure I'm with the right signs. Yes, I'm going to start with this duality, with this boson-fermion duality. And I'm going to add to both sides i over 2 pi a db plus i over 4 pi b db. So if you want to ignore this spin c business, just think of a and b as being two u1 gauge fields. But if you're more ambitious and you want to understand u1 gauge fields, then this is a valid combination such that we still are independent of a choice of spin structure, and we don't even need the spin manifold in four dimensions. So, so that's a good combination. We start from something that has this property. We add it to both sides, and then we turn A into a dynamical field by writing little a. So what do we find? So on the left-hand side, it's easy. So the left-hand side becomes I psi bar d slash a psi plus i over 2 pi a db plus i over 4 pi b db. So have we seen this theory before? Yes, this is QED. If we turn off the background field B, that's an ordinary U1 gauge field, this is a single fermion coupled to a gauge field, little a. So this is QED. coupled to U1, and in our conventions, it's what we call U1 level a half. We call our bus business with the fermion. When we want to turn on, uh, there is also Maxwell, I need, Mac so this is my notation here always. I add Maxwell term, I float long distance, and I look for a non-trivial fixed point. So all this notation means I add the Maxwell term, I add the mass term, and I'm looking at this big space of couplings, and look for a second order point. That's what this notation means. And I've said that a number of times, both in the bosonic examples, and I'm still going to use the same convention. OK, so that's what we have on the left. If you just write ordinary max, if you were very naive, so say, OK, what's, Mac, what's Mac QED? There's this term, and there's a Maxwell term. What does it do at long distances? I just forget the f square, just on dimensional grounds. So now I'm just left with this thing. That's what QED is at long distances. And I emphasize here that the global U1 symmetry at question is the monopole operator made out of A, and it's coupled to a background field B. And so this is given. But since A is a spin C connection, I must add this level 1 term in the, in the background field. So that's the left-hand side. That's the easy part. Let's work out the right-hand side. So here we have an alphabet soup of fields. So I'm going to add these terms. And then A, let's collect all the terms that depend on A on the right-hand side. We have this. So we have minus i over 2 pi b d a. This and that is independent of A. A also appears in the term I added, plus i over 2 pi a d b. And this term is without a. So a, this is little a, and I'm going to integrate here by parts. So oh, little a appears only in these two terms. And this is, again, a theory that we'll learn how to deal with. We integrate out a. And when we integrate out a, we'll learn that little b is the same as big b up to a gauge transformation. 
Okay, so this is how I, this is the set of tricks that I keep using. So now I'm just going to use that in the left hand side. So what do we have in the right hand side? We're going to have d b phi absolute value square plus phi absolute value to the fourth. minus i over 4 pi bdb from here. This term we already took care of. This term we already took care of. And this guy exactly cancels that, i.e. the wilson pressure theory. This is interesting. We learn that QED of U1 level a half coupled to background field B is dual to the Wilson Fisher fixed point. This should be extremely surprising. It's extremely surprising for many reasons. Let's start with the easy ones. The right hand side is a purely bosonic theory couples to a background field big B, ordinary U1. This theory appears, depends on fermions, and couples to a, some gauge fields and this and that. It looks like it needs a choice of spin structure. How can it they be dual? One is fermionic, the other is bosonic. But the spin C business comes and saves the day. Second, this theory is manifestly time reversal invariant. It's on length scale. This theory is not. In fact, this is the hallmark of a theory that breaks time reversal. This is the theory with a parity anomaly. It's U1. There's an anomaly. So the theory is not time reversal invariant. But by now, we know what it really means. What it means is that short distances, because of the anomaly, time reversal is gone. But at long distances, there is an emergent time reversal symmetry that describes the fixed point. Now, a lot is known about this theory, both experimentally and numerically. And it was measured to enormous accuracy. It was even measured in this, the critical exponents were even measured in the space shuttle, the theory on the right-hand side. The theory on the left-hand side has two phases, very similar to the two phases of this theory, very similar to the two phases of this theory, which are gapped. And the global U1 is broken or unbroken, as we discussed. But something is wrong here. Yes. And okay. But the dynamics of this theory is still controversial the theory on the left. And a lot of people are doing numerics of this. There are lots of papers saying it's clear that it there are two phases, depending on the mass of the fermion. But there are lots of claims in the literature of whether the transition is first order or second order, where various symmetries are broken or not. But the claim here is that if it is second order, it's not any random second order point, but it is the Wilson Fisher fixed point, second order point. Question. What do you mean by confining? I mean, you have nope. Nope. Well, the surprising thing is not so much, first of all, yes. But second, the surprising thing is not that you get any ra some theory of bosons. But it's a well-known one. So duality is mostly interesting when one of the two sides is either a free theory or an interacting theory that you've already learned about. So you say, ah, what does this theory do at long distances? So it's a fixed point. It's a new fixed point. Just add it to the list. That's interesting, but not that interesting. But if you say that long distances, it's a theory we already know, that's more interesting. Because it relates. So relating two things you don't know <laughs> if one thing you knew and the other not, you feel like you learned something. 
And if you, you relate two things that you knew and you thought were interesting, and I say, oh, not only do you know them, they're actually the same, that's surprising. So we talked about time reversal invariance, and we said that at long distances, this theory has time reversal symmetry. And the time reversal symmetry acts correctly with the correct anomaly that, that is needed with this B. But absolutely crucial in this map is this term. So when we look at QED with level a half, if we couple it to a background B, we have this I over 2 pi BDA. That's obvious. This is the global U1 symmetry of, the, of QED. But we must add it i over 4 pi bdb. So we have to add such a counter term to the left-hand side to match with the right-hand side. First, this is needed in order to reproduce the answers. And second, this is needed to make the theory really be independent of spin structure. So all these things hang together, and all the coefficients are what they need to be. And maybe I messed them up on the blackboard, but they are correcting the references I gave. Uh, as Douglas emphasized yesterday, the factors of 2, or related to that, the signs, factors of 2 in the exponents, or signs, is the most important part here. Everything else is kind of doesn't matter, but the factors of 2 is wh what the story is all about. And when you talk about fermions versus bosons, you could say that this is just a difference of sign, but <coughs> this is a very important sign. There was a question here? Okay. So I leave it as an exercise for you to start the basic duality, this one, and construct other theories. So what we did here was to add this thing to both sides. And we can add it to the left-hand side and to this side, or to the left-hand side and this side. And there are all sorts of things we could do. We can also add with different coefficients. And we can derive lots of dualities. QED couples to U1, say, with level 3 halves or so forth. Because once we know how to dualize a free fermion coupled to a gauge field, it's important that we have the gauge field is standing there so that we can easily gauge with complete control over all these counter terms that need to be added with all the two pi's. There is no more guesswork. From this point on, I pre presented a machine that produces candidate dualities. This does not prove any of them. But these dualities are closely related. <coughs> And we can move in the space of dualities simply by adding such terms, for example, this term, and gauging this or gauging <coughs> that, and produce new boson-boson dualities, new boson-fermion dualities, new fermion-fermion dualities. Some of them are more interesting than others. And I'm going to actually present some of them because I think they are quite interesting. <coughs> related to that, I'm debating how much of that to do here. OK, I'll do that if I have more time later. Because what I really want to do is take these dualities and produce. So we had a boson-boson duality. And the first one is the famous particle vortex duality from the late 70s. And we derived a bunch of boson-fermion dualities. This is a free fermion with some interacting bosonic theory. And this is an interacting fermion with some interacting boson theory. And I'd like to produce now some fermion-fermion dualities. And what I'm going to do is exactly the same set of tricks again and again. So what I'm going to do is add an appropriate term like this to the two sides. And do something like this, use this thing, and then go back. So I have a long list. So I start with one. This is the same as some bosonic theory, which is the same as another bosonic theory. And then I can move again and find a fermion-fermion duality. Before I do that, are there any questions? OK. So I'm going to start with this duality. So I'm going to write it very explicitly, because we need it here. So the 
all the dualities are IR dualities, all of them. These are different theories in the UV, which flow to the same fixed point, mm -hmm. and that fixed point might or might not be a free theory. And how many such IR fixed points are there? This is a very good question. Uh, I don't know the answer. It would well, be fantastic. How many do we know? Sorry? How many, how many do we know? We know a lot. We know of a lot of them. Uh, but I think there is no guarantee that we know all of them. And, and it might be that some of those that we know and we think are different are actually the same. Sorry. But uh, let me just finish here. But the main point here is that A, I don't prove it's a fixed point. It might be that it's a first order transition and then all these dualities only describe the two sides. But the dualities will show that all the symmetries and all the anomalies are exactly the same. And furthermore, if it is a fixed point, I'm saying that the, the, that CFT, this conformal field theory at the fixed point, is the same, but it might or might not be a CFT that we are familiar with. David. Uh, you, said, you showed an example of an emergent T symmetry. Yes. Yes. What is an example of an observable that is not T invariant? Oh, almost all of them. You want T invariant or T odd would be good enough. The mass term, the mass term for the, the oh, that's that's an observable phi absolute value square. It's it's uh, well everything, everything. So all the operators are transformed on the T. So phi absolute value square is even under the naive T symmetry in the UV, but then the symmetry is gone because of the churn simons term. In the IR, it flows to an operator, which is time reversal odd. And that time reversal odd. Oh, I would see this. Yeah. Correlation functions. Correlation. Yeah, so in the <laughs> case of the free fermion, I would say, who cares about the boson? I'll just compute it oh, in the fermion. Yeah, phi square maps to psi bar psi. Yeah, with itself, for example. The two-point function of phi absolute value square. So that's, that's even. even. That's even, even that's yeah, but I, this theory has fermions. I can have many fermions, <coughs> and uh, there are many complicated things. I could even put the theory on a complicated manifold and show that when I reverse the orientation, the UV theory is different, and the IR answers are the same. <coughs> or another way of saying it, the partition function on orientable three manifolds are all real. That's a non-trivial <coughs> A long distance correlation function. At short distance ones, they're not, but at long distances, they're real. That's an observable consequence. Well, even in the standard model, there's an emergent T symmetry, but in a kind of a boring way, right? CP is violated in the weak interactions, and that's not too important in, uh, in atomic physics. And so in a way, this is similar, except that there, what happens is that the coupling that is gone, it's this coupling is just driven to zero at long distances. What happens here is that new degrees of freedom emerge, and in the new degrees of freedom, uh, we have time reversal. In other words, time reversal in the standard model is a transformation on the fields in the Lagrangian, and some terms flip sign, but that term is not important at low energies. What happens here is that the emergent time reversal symmetry is not something that acts on the fields at short distances, but it acts non-locally on the fields at short distances. And then it becomes an emergent <laughs> symmetry. Because phi, which is not gauge invariant, transforms at the time reversal to phi hat, which is also non gauge invariant, but in the dual variables. And so time reversal is, is implemented by duality, if you wish. That's why it could have, that's why it could have an anomaly. Yeah. Otherwise, if it had been too easy, it would not be anomalous. But here, it, it, we have this time reversal symmetry and, uh, and the anomaly. It's more sophisticated than in the standard model. In the standard model, there is this uh, Kobayashi-Maskawa delta. So we can have the naive time reversal symmetry. The terms with delta violate it. But for atomic physics, delta is not that important. And therefore, atomic physics is essentially <coughs> time reversal invariant. What happens here is that we cannot say, oh, we just take the naive time reversal symmetry and one operator disappears, because time reversal acts on the fundamental fields in a non-local way. It's more subtle. And that's why, yeah, it's more subtle. 
So I'd like to write this duality again and just show you how the set of tricks works because every I picked a, a bunch of examples. The first one was that we got free fermions. That was interesting. The second was a theory that attracts a lot of interest. This QED, this is the basic gauge theory in the two plus one dimensions. And the Wilson Fisher theory, which is another basic theory. I have tons of non-abelian analogs, and in fact, the person who deserves most credit for the non-abelian version of this sit sits to your left. At the moment, he's sitting to your left. <laughs> this is awful because this is not uh, seen in. Th th yeah, there are lots of non-abelian examples of this, and which was supposed to be the topic of my fourth lecture, but this is probably not going to happen. But this is just the abelian version. So I'll do the same thing again. So we have, what do we have here? I psi bar d slash a plus i over 2 pi a d b plus i over 4 pi b b b. And that's dual to d b phi absolute value square plus phi absolute value to the fourth. And again, I have all the qualifications. And I keep forgetting the psi here. And all the qualifications are said before, and some terms are written in form notations, and others are not. And this is what this duality is. And I'm going to continue to apply the same set of tricks. So what do I do? I add to both sides i over 4 pi bdb. That does not respect the spin c business, the <coughs> uh, spin charge relation. So I'm also adding to pi bda with another background A. So by doing that, I stay within these theories, which are spin charge theories. I add this thing to the left-hand side and to the right-hand side. And then I promote B to little b, which means I add the Maxwell term, and I integrate over it, and I look for a fix, and I check the change the value of the gauge coupling, and maybe readjust some other relevant operators to look for a non-trivial fixed point. And I do it to both sides. On the left-hand side, on the left-hand side, it's relatively easy. So we'll do that first. I want to do all these exercises, the, all the arithmetic on the blackboard, to show you how easy it is. So there are lots of signs and lots of room to make mistakes, but, but it's really completely straightforward. You just follow your nose and you do it. So we copy psi bar d slash a psi, that was copied, plus i over 2 pi a d b, because we promoted this b, b. And we have one b d b from here and another one from here. So we have plus 2 over 4 pi with an i b d b. And we also have the coupling to the background field, 2 pi bda. So that's what we have on the left-hand side. What do we have on the right-hand side? This is now b square. <coughs> 4 pi bdb plus i over 2 pi BDA. So what do we have on the left-hand side? We have QED couples to another dynamical field, little b, which has its own churn simons term, and that is coupled to a background field. This looks like a mouthful. What do we have on the right-hand side? On the right-hand side, we have the same Wilson-Fisher theory coupled to little b with level 1 with some... Uh, with coupling to a background field. So in fact, this is a theory we've already discussed. This is a theory we've already discussed. So we can use the duality we had there, that this theory is essentially a free fermion, the theory on the right. The theory on the right is essentially a free fermion. So when I move everything from the right and to the left, I learn that I, psi bar, d slash a psi, this is again a free fermion, is dual to db 
of phi, absolute value squared, plus phi to the fourth. So I'm using this duality of the free fermion that we had before, plus i over 4 pi d d b, plus i over 2 pi d d a, and I'm keeping track of the background, the coupling to the background fields, g a. So I'm using this on the right-hand side, and I change the name of the fields to learn that this thing is also dual to a theory of just fermions. So I call them now chi to distinguish from that, a chi. So bear with me, there will be a surprise, a d b plus i over 2 pi b 2i, I have 2i over 4 pi b d b plus i over 2 pi b d a plus i over 4 pi a d a. So what did I do? I keep playing the same game again and again, hoping to land on something interesting. And I learned that the free fermion theory can also be written as an interacting fermion theory. You could say, who cares, we already know it's free, but this theory is an interesting theory. It's an interacting theory, and the claim is that it is the same as the free fermion. So what do we have on the right-hand side? We have QED coupled to a background, coupled to a dynamical field B through this off-diagonal term, and U1 level 2, and it has a U1 symmetry, and coupled to A. Hmm. I am far behind. Yes. Do you have any theory in the fermions bound states? Is the John Simon strong enough to bind them? I think you're using the language of the 70s and 80s, which is very non-relativistic a uh, way of thinking about quantum field theory. The novelty here is in precisely A, making this language precise, and B, talking about the case where everything is massless and interacting. So there's a lot of discussion. There's a lot of discussion in the literature coming under the name of flux attachment and so forth, talking about massive particles interacting with Chern-Simons terms. Huge literature on that, and the Chern-Simons term changes the statistics and the spin of the massive particle. What we have here is far, far beyond that. First of all, I'm not talking about massive particles, but about massless particles. Second, they are not first quantized. They are second quantized. And third, we let them flow all the way to the infrared and have a statement about the infrared. The, to make this more precise, if I deform these theories by relevant operators, these phi's and psi's become massive, and they interact with Chern-Simons terms, which change the, statisti the statistics of the particles. So this kind of language applies in one of these phases. The main thing I would like to concentrate, I'm concentrating on here, is the phase transition between them. So I'm not saying, oh, there is a gapped phase with particles with these quantum numbers or that, or those quantum numbers. But I'm saying it all emerges from a particular fixed point. And if I establish the duality of the fixed point, everything else should follow. So the kind of reasoning, of massive particles coupled to gauge fields and so forth, is <laughs> good at the level of consistency checks. The statement here is far, far stronger than that. So this duality is actually extremely interesting. It's interesting because it has appeared before in some form. All the coefficients here are completely well-defined, integers, and in fact, I'm even whatever has to be an integer is an integer, no fractions. And second, I even pay attention to the spin charge relation. Some people in the literature try to integrate out the field B from here, here, and here. That's incorrect, because the field B induces long-range order. You shouldn't integrate it out. So if you integrate out the field B, you're going to get some fractional coefficients here, which capture, so which is okay for all local properties, but will not capture the global properties correctly. And since we are dealing with topological phases of matter, the global properties is the most crucial thing that we are talking about. So that duality appeared before. For lack of time, uh, I'm going to skip various checks of this duality as far as 
deforming them by masses, mapping all the operators from the left-hand side and the right-hand side. It works. Uh, we can deform by relevant operator various mass terms and map the two phases. On the left-hand side, it's easy. We've already analyzed that. We have gap fermion with either spin plus a half or minus a half, with or without an ADA. The same result is obtained on the right-hand side by using the set of tricks that we discussed. So I'm decided to skip all that. And I will just make one more comment on this. This duality is supposed to describe uh, electrons at in the first Landau level at half filling. So it's, it's not kind of a somebody who likes to play with quantum field theories. This is an actual system, and this was proposed by Son. And this is actually a more precise version of what Son did. So we've seen a lot of dualities. I'll soon show another one, which I particularly like. But we've seen a lot of dualities, but these are not independent. So if one of them is proven wrong, then the whole structure would collapse. So I'm really in danger here. But peop th there's always the option of the transition being first order. And that I have nothing to say about. But if the transition is second order and the duality is not true, this whole structure evaporates. So in that sense, it's, it's very rigid. Also, if I assume that some of them, others imp are implied. So the boson-boson duality is on, one is on the, ha the best footing. If I assume the boson-fermion dualities, I can derive the boson-boson duality. I can also derive the fermion-fermion dualities. If I assume the fermion-fermion dualities, I cannot derive the others. So some of these relations are one directional, the other not. And people who went through several decades of studying dualities are very, very familiar with this kind of reasoning. You apply S duality, you apply T duality, and then you apply T duality again in another circle, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and you move in the space of dual theories, hoping to land on your feet. And every time you land on your feet, you say, well, it gives me more confidence in the full structure. Before I move to the next example, are there any questions? So, like, you have this pair of theory that you believe to be um, dual with the IR, and then you, I mean, then you do something to it. If you add some terms and then like, get into some background field, uh, how do you feel convinced that these new theories will, will again be dual with the IR? Okay, I, I, that's a good question, and I'm often asked this question. Once I'm in the IR, in the f after the first step, so, I, so what do we have? We have two different theories flow to the same fixed point. Once I'm in the fixed point here, I can deform here by a small relevant operator. That's what you said. I'm adding terms, gauging, etc. So that translates here to a small relevant operator. So if the first duality is right, it translates here to a well-defined relevant operator. And whenever this takes me, this should also take me. That's the statement that the dual here. The statement that the duality is true in the infrared means that if I deform by a small, with a relevant operator, with a small enough coefficient, they remain dual. So that's clear. What is not clear, if along the way, this whole structure collapses, there could be a first order transition. That I cannot exclude. And specifically, I said we have, so when we gauge, so when we turn on a mass, that's easy. But when we, we turn on a, a gauge field, we make it dynamical. We also need to take 1 over g square. And we'd have to take g to infinity as we flow to the infrared. And then by the time we do that, we might have crossed a phase transition. So what I do know is that the global symmetries will match. And the anomalies will match. And so forth. But there is no guarantee that such a, first order, such, such a second order transition exists. So for a condensed matter physicist, I think this should be quite natural and say, OK, somewhere in the space of couplings, there might be such a thing. In high energy physics, we would like a statement which is much more concrete. With these particular couplings, do we have enough couplings to cover a region that has such a second order point? And the assumption here is that the answer is yes. If not, this is not wrong. It's still right. It describes the phases, but it does not describe the non-trivial fixed point in between. But in many of these theories, 
we can actually prove rather convincingly that there is a second order point. For example, if we take any one of these QED-like theories, either of scalars or, or fermions, and we add the Chern Simons term, in the limit k going to infinity, it's clear that there's a second order point. So that's one limit where it's clear. There are also string constructions which work. If in the non abelian versions of this, this is connected to Vasiliev theory, there's a whole story there where we know it's a second order point. So, and then everything is clear. So this is connected to many other things. There are dualities of supersymmetric theories which are on much firmer footing, where this whole worry of the transition being first order is not present. <coughs> and this was subjected to many more tests. You can break supersymmetry explicitly and flow to these dualities. Again, it doesn't prove that it's right, but it gives you more confidence in it. So for the sake of this talk, I'm just going to assume that this is true. And I'll be, I'm very interested in checking, say, the numerics here. The numerics here is being done. It's still being controversial and is doing it with increasing accuracy. And whether this theory has a second-order transition or first-order transition is a question I'm very interested in. Sorry, on the lattice, yeah. And there are different lattice techniques. I'm not an expert in that, but this is a huge industry. The studying. Uh, so if there is a second or second order point, they should find the the critical exponents, and there are different numerical methods. And at the moment, they forget whether it agrees with the claim here. They don't even agree with each other. So, but. Okay, they don't agree now, but within a few years they will agree. Right? This, this technology is evolving rapidly. And there are cousins of this theory where it actually has been done very accurately, and which I'm going to discuss now a cousin of this theory. So when we discuss the parity anomaly, when we discuss the parity anomaly, we said, or that the issue was that the fermion had charge 1. And we said that if the fermion has charge 2, there are good news and bad news. The bad news, if the fermion has charge, one, it's has charge 2, is that we don't spec we do not satisfy the spin charge relation. So if the fermion has charge 2, we, don't spec we, we do not satisfy the spin charge relation. So we do need a spin manifold to formulate the theory. This is a price I'm willing to pay now. But the good news is that the system <coughs> is time reversal invariant already, already in the UV. And to be precise, as it stands, it's not. But there is an allowed counter term that makes it time reversal invariant. So specifically, the theory I'm interested in is U1 with charge 2. And this is work done with two fantastic collaborators. Clay Cordova and Poshen Shin. And the theory we're interested in is I, using the same notation, psi bar d slash 2c. C is lowercase c. Psi, so this is QED with, the firm with charge 2. And I'm adding a Chern Simons term 2i over 4 pi cdc. And I'm adding a background field the way I usually do, CDU. Uppercase U is a background field. So why did I choose the coefficient here to be minus 2? Because with this coefficient, I preserve time reversal symmetry. We discussed that when we discussed the free fermion. Fermion with charge 2, as it stands, it does not preserve time reversal symmetry. But there is a choice of Chern Simons term that adjusts <coughs> such that adjusts the time reversal symmetry. OK, so this theory is time reversal invariant. It's not the same as QED with, what, with fermion of charge 1. And there is a valid question, what does this theory do at long distances? So is the question clear? Not, not the answer, the question. So QED with charge 2, what does it do at long distances? So we know what we need to do. We take any one of these fermions, dualities, exactly the one I just erased with chi. Uh, this was terrible, so I'll copy it again. So we start with i k slash t slash a chi i over 2 pi a d b plus 2 i over 4 pi b d b plus 
i over 2 pi bda plus i over 4 pi ada. So this was a complicated theory, and that was the same as this theory. OK, so we would like to understand what this theory does. So what should we do? First, we need to make this the same as that. So I'm going to substitute a equals 2c. So which means in wherever I see a, I'm going to write 2c, and view c as a dynamical field. This will reproduce this term. I also need to add these two terms. And I will say add minus 2i over 4 pi cdc plus i over 2 pi cdu. So I can do that in the two sides of the duality. So what do I do? I take a free fermion theory. And now I can say, add whatever term, Simon's term you want. And instead of A, write whatever gauge field you want. And just map that to the left-hand side. In the left-hand side, the duality will still be true with all the assumptions I made. And then I will just have to calculate. Yes? So I've already said that I'm sacrificing this property which means I'm going to limit myself to spin manifolds. And then it will be an ordinary gauge field. I furthermore s restrict myself, because if a is 2c, it means that the fluxes of a are multiples of 4 pi, not 2 pi. But that's the problem I'm trying to solve. I'm trying to, so to ask, what does this theory dual to? So I say, oh, I know what the free fermion is. I just have to add the appropriate a and add the appropriate counter terms on the right. I do that on the left. And it looks like I'm going to get an alphabet soup of fields and so forth. But I will just I have a set of rules how to manipulate these fields. And if I'm lucky, I'll end up with something simple. And if I'm not lucky, I'll end up with the correct answer, which is not simple. And if I make mistakes in the algebra, I will end up with the wrong answer. <laughs> but I really emphasize that it's a straightforward exercise. Right? There's no guesswork. No guesswork in the sense, once we've established that, I know how to find a dual to this theory. And the dual might or might not be an interesting one. Th that's the power of this method. right? It gives you an answer. It might or might not be a correct answer, but it might or might not be interesting. So let's do the algebra, because I think it's illuminating. So I'm doing these manipulations on the left-hand side. And there are lots of fields. And as you will soon see, it basically collapses. So what do we have on the left-hand side? So the first term is copied. Then there are various terms. Wherever I see big A, which is here and here, I write 2C. And I'm adding these two terms. Right? So I'm just copying it here. And minus 2IC. So I have minus I over 2 pi little a plus minus u db plus 2i over 4 pi b plus c d b plus c plus i over 2 pi b plus c d u d u. So assuming I did not make a mistake copying it from my notes, it's lots of terms. But then we realize that B, B sits here, here, and here. But C, uh, what, which one did I want? Right. C sits only here and here. Also the last term. And, and the last term, thank you. So I'm just going to give this combination a new name, C hat. OK, so this would be C hat. So that's good, because c hat appears only here and here. So this, factor, this sector factorizes. This is u1 level 2 of c hat. It factorizes. What do we have here? Well, this is, again, the trick that we've already learned. b appears only here with the coefficient i over 2 pi. So it acts as a Lagrange multiplier. And what it tells us is that a equals u. So what do we end up with? Big U chi 
plus 2i over 4 pi c hat dc hat plus i over 2 pi c hat du. So what do we see? We see a free fermion. We see a decoupled u1 level 2. And we see a classical field u that couples to both. Conclusion, u1 time reversal invariant QED with an electron with charge 2 is dual at long distances to a free fermion. A free fermion plus a decoupled topological field theory u1 level 2. It's not completely decoupled, right? Because C and U interact via the lock. But it couples only, this is only coupling to background fields. So if I turn off the background fields, there are two decoupled sectors, and I'm telling you that there was a U1 in the UV that big U coupled to, it's a classical field, and that U1 is identified at long distances with a combination of a coupling to chi and a coupling to the U1 level 2. And I'm going to make a lot of comments about this duality. So QED, which is really U1 level a half, flows to a fixed point. And the fixed point is the Wilson-Fisher fixed point. The same theory with charge 2, which in perturbation theory is almost indistinguishable, and the same Feynman diagrams and so forth. And I adjusted the churn simons term so that it is time reversal invariant, which is possible for charge 2 but not for charge 1. This theory is really a free fermion at long distances. So it's again one of these dualities where we have a free theory at long distances and therefore, we really know the answer. So we started at short distances with u1 with psi of charge 2. And we go to the infrared. This is the mass of the fermion. So when the fermion has such at its time reversal invariant, invariant. When the mass is positive, we have a u1 level 2. When the mass is negative, we have u1 level minus 2. And in between, before there was a question, what are we going to get in between? And strictly speaking, we don't know. We know for sure this. We know this for sure. But we don't know, strictly speaking, what happens here. But the duality suggests that what we have here is a free fermion. and it decoupled u1 level 2, which, as we discussed, is the same as u1 level minus 2. So as we vary the mass at long distances, u1 level minus 2 is the same as u1 level 2, because everything is a spin theory here. And I emphasized that before, that for spin theories, u1 level 2 is the same as u1 level minus 2. So there is a decoupled u1 level 2 all along as we vary the mass. And so the long distance behavior is very simple. There's a decoupled U1 level 2, and there's a Dirac fermion chi, which is free, and it has mass here, and it has mass here, and it's massless at the transition point. That's a very concrete statement, which again can be tested on the lattice. So here, not only do we say there's a second order point, but we know exactly what the second order point is. negative mass for the fermion. And on the right-hand side, I have positive mass. And we can analyze it in a lot more detail along the same lines we've already done a bunch of times in this lecture. At short distances, so let's first analyze, check this duality further. And as always, we go after the monopoles. So at short distances, we have this theory of the fermion with charge 2. And it has monopole operators, M. The monopole operator has fermion zero modes. So there are psi zero modes and psi bar zero modes. And since the, this carries charge, magnetic charge 1, and this carries electric charge 2, the number of zero modes is 2. So there are two psi zero modes and two psi bar zero modes. We can quantize the zero modes. And for lack of time, I'm not going to do it explicitly. But quantizing the zero modes, z 
zero modes. The gauge invariant M monopole operator has spin a half. So at short distances, this theory U1 with charge 2, which is time reversal invariant, has a monopole operator which is a fermion. It's quite obvious what's going to happen here. I'm going to identify that with our friend Kai. So at short distances, the theory has monopole operators because of fermion zero modes. They become fermions. And these fermions are very complicated, big objects at short distances. But by the time we are at long distances, they become this massless fermion. So the massless decoupled fermions at long distances started its life as a monopole operator at short distances. This is common in duality. You always start in step one when you analyze the kinematics. That's what are the symmetries? What are the anomalies? What kind of interesting operators can we construct, especially monopole operators and so forth? And these monopole operators go to the, these monopole operators might end up being the physical degrees of freedom at long distances. Now I would like to deform. Yes. There are two sides and two side bars. So, uh, okay, why would I do that? So the two sides, have, so we have the spin thing in U1. So the U1, the charge of the U1 of this is 2 and this is minus 2. These are the charges. And since there are two of them, they have spin a half, spin a half. And they are the following states. There is a state which we can call 0, which all the sides on this is 0. Then there are the states psi bar i. There are two of them on this. And then there is psi bar 1, psi bar 2. So there are four states, as you said correctly. Because of the u1 level 2, the charges are shifted. And the charge, so we wrote spin here and the u1 here. So this has 2, this has charge 0. This has charge, 0 has a, we have this that psi annihilates it. A psi bar is minus 2, so that has a 2, and this has a minus 2. These are the U1 charges. And the spin, there's one of these, so it's 0. This is spin a half, that's spin a half, and that's 0. So I've done it on the blackboard. Does this answer, th is this what you asked? Yes. Good. So this is gauge invariant, so this is the one I'm looking at. And it's, has, it's U1 neutral, it's gauge invariant, and it has spin a half. So just by looking at the short distance theory, we identify a spin a half operator. See that it's good. The theory doesn't satisfy the spin charge relation. So all the gauge invariant polynomials in the fields are bosons. But the monopoles are not, telling us that we violate the spin charge relation. And indeed, the fermions are spinners. That's kinematics. The dynamics is that this complicated bosonic, op this complicated fermionic operator becomes dimension one at long distances, and this is the, the main actor in the long distance theory. Now, I can check more the global symmetries and what couples to what, but there's a little bit of a surprise here that's, well, that's, that's a little bit surprising that we get a massless <coughs> fermion, which is a monopole, but I'd like to connect it to something I said earlier, which looked like an esoteric example. Now, it's common in condensed matter physics to say that having this U1 with, yes? Ah, excellent question. So I should have said that before I changed the theory. Thank you. So at short distances in the UV, we had fermions of charge 2. That doesn't stop us from taking probe particles with charge 1. So there is a Wilson loop with charge 1, which is an interesting line operator. Its square is like the identity operator. It's not that exciting because it can be screened by size. What does this mean? This means that the short distance theory has pro particles that cannot be screened. And that means that it has a one-form global symmetry. And one-form global symmetry is just like any other symmetry. 
it should match between the UV and the IR. Well, this is dual to the U1 level 2 that we discussed. That also has a, a Wilson line whose square is 1. So you could say, OK, we found the fermion. The fermion was really started its life as the monopole. But why is there a decoupled U1 level 2? What's its role in life? And its role in life is to provide a dual to the Wilson loop at short distances. I did not discuss it here. There are also more subtle gravitational anomalies that have to match between the UV and the IR. And the U1 level 2 saves the day also there. I should also add that at short distances, we have C and T. That's actually going to be crucial soon. And I'm going to use my conventions that T preserves the electric charge. And there's also the other convention. This is Talia's convention, where T, what, this is what I would call CT, reverses electric charge. In the IR, things are reversed. Indeed, the U1 of this fermion is the magnetic symmetry of the UV. So the magnetic symmetry of the UV acts electrically on chi. And therefore, Talia's convention is more natural, from my perspective, in the IR, whereas my convention is more natural in the UV. This will soon be crucial. So in condensed matter physics, they have some complex, this U1 could be emergent and so forth, and this magnetic symmetry might not be an exact symmetry of the problem. And therefore, we would like to deform the system by adding a monopole operator to the Lagrangian. So we can take this system, once we have a duality, we can start messing with it. And what we're going to do is add a monopole operator to the Lagrangian. So somebody could say, well, you can't add the monopole operator, it's a fermion. So that's not a good idea. But we can add the monopole square. So I'm going to add in the UV m square. So this is something that carries charge 2 under the magnetic symmetry. And it explicitly breaks the magnetic symmetry of this B, the magnetic symmetry, to a Z2 subgroup which is the same as minus 1 to the f. So this is an interesting thing to do from the perspective of condensed matter physics. They look, call it compact U1, and I have to write this complex conjugate. How do we translate that to the IR? Well, we know this m is this chi. So in the IR, there are two kinds of mass terms we can study. We can study the mass term chi 1 bar chi 1 plus chi 2 bar chi 2. And the coefficient here is the short distance m. And this epsilon multiplies chi bar 1 chi 1 minus chi bar 2 chi 2. So let me remind you the notation. Every fermion, which is a Dirac fermion, I write as chi 1 plus i chi 2 in terms of two Majorana fermions. This term preserves the U1 that rotates them. And this is the map of the Dirac mass term at short distances. And this is the mass I wrote here, that the fermion gets a U1 preserving mass, either with positive m or with negative m. The double monopole operator has the opposite sign. It carries charge 2 under the magnetic U1. And then if we just look at this mass matrix, we find two fermions, one with mass m plus epsilon and the other with mass m minus epsilon. What does it mean? It means that at m minus epsilon and at m equals plus epsilon, we now have a massless Majorana fermion. And in between, we don't have a transition. <coughs> So in the, in the deformed theory, we have U1 level 2, which just goes along for the right. And as we vary M, we first hit one Majorana, massless Majorana fermion. We cross the transition. We hit another Majorana, mass, a massless Majorana fermion, and we cross the transition again. 
Now, the operator, this, mass, this monopole deformation with coefficient epsilon, is an irrelevant operator at short distances. And as you see, it's very important at long distances. Such a situation where we have a r irrelevant operator at short distances, which becomes so important at long distances, is called dangerously irrelevant operator. It's irrelevant, but it is dangerous to ignore it. It's meaningful in this context only when epsilon is very small. Because when epsilon is very large, I have to be more careful how I define it at short distances. And even in the, firm, the formulas I wrote here, or more precisely here, there are various coefficients that I suppressed. And they depend on long distance computation, on complicated computation. But this is linear in m, and this is linear in epsilon. So to leading order in m and epsilon, this is right. And we see that the fermion splits. A special case of interest is to stay at the point m equals 0. So imagine we are at m equals 0, and epsilon is non-zero. So we sit here. The spectrum is gapped. The spectrum is gapped. We still have, seems like we still have some time reversal symmetry, because which reflects m. And but the algebra of time reversal is non-trivial. In fact, we have already analyzed this problem before. Who remembers where we analyzed it? it we did a dictionary to, to map to the one we analyzed. So when we discussed free fermion in three dimensions, I said that there are two mass terms that we can turn on, a U1 preserving mass and a U1 violating mass. With the U1 violate preserving mass, with the U1 preserving mass, we violated some time reversal, and we analyze it in detail. With the U1 violating mass, recall we break the U1, we preserve some C2. But there are also two interesting symmetries, char charge conjugation and time reversal, which we analyze in all gory detail. And depending on how we represent the U1 breaking term, they satisfy a funny algebra. They satisfy a funny algebra, which here <laughs> do you want to make it more more conspicuous? <laughs> a, thank you for distracting me. <laughs> the difference between the example we worked out then, which I'm not going to work out in detail here. Now, in this example, is that the U1 question here is the magnetic U1, and the U1 in the discussion there was the electric one. So all we need to do when we translate from one to the other is that Talia and I will switch positions, which is typical in duality. I said the T and CT change roles. So whatever we did there with T and CT will now be CT and T. And this is something that can be checked both in the UV and in the IR. And after I've taken my notes from the other computation, I want to write the answer. It, this thing violate, breaks the magnetic symmetry, preserves minus 1 to the F. And there is a T, which T squared is 1, not minus 1 to the F. And CT squared is minus 1 to the F. And CT is Tc times minus 1 to the f. So this system, both at short distances and at long distances, has this peculiar symmetry. It does not have the u1. The u1 is gone. A fermion number, minus 1 to the f, is still there. This is not going to go anywhere because it's part of the Lorentz group. But time reversal in the uv is not a standard one. And it does not commute with charge conjugation. So we've had that before in, in the free fermion. And we worked it out in detail. And you could say this is a perverse mass term to turn on. But now we see it arising in a very natural context. We have this U1 level 2. We wanted to break the magnetic symmetry, which is a common thing to do. We turn this thing with a monopole square. We could analyze the symmetries in the UV. 
already if we analyze the symmetries in the UV, we will come up with this un unbroken symmetry. And as a check, we see this unbroken symmetry at long distances. Which I got to say that when I first saw this symmetry, I thought this is insane. How can this possibly be true? But you see a garden variety Lagrangian that leads to this symmetry. We see exactly this symmetry in the UV, in the IR, in the free field theory. And sure enough, the UV and the IR give us the same deformed symmetry, which gives us more confidence <coughs> that this is right. Now, I'm now in the middle of, I think I'm near the end of lecture two. <laughs> what I did not discuss is various other examples where we pl play the same trick, uh, still with abelian theories, finding all sorts of other amusing dualities, including some that people asked me before. So let me just say that if I make k bigger, the monopole operator becomes a current, and there's an enhanced non-abelian global symmetry in the IR, which is quite surprising. There's a huge subject that I did not touch on, doing all that with non-abelian groups. In fact, historically, this is where the story started. It started with non-abelian groups at large n. And there, the connections between different dualities is even more dramatic, because we can have SUN and SON and spin n and this with the spin structure, without a spin structure, and one duality implies a hello. There's a huge web of dualities with lots of interesting connections, connecting also to all sorts of other properties of topological field theories like level rank duality and others. So it's as always with dualities, at various corners we find something that we know is true and that gives us confidence. Since we derived it, it gives us confidence that the whole structure is right, but it's not a proof that the whole structure is right. There's also connection to string theory. There's connection to supersymmetric theories. This is a huge subject, and personally, I've been saying it now for a number of years. I don't think the end is in sight. I feel that there are a lot more examples to find out here. I do not know how dramatic they will be, how surprising they will be, and so forth. I think it should be explored, just at least at the level of exploration. And maybe if we have more examples, somebody will really understand what's going on here, what's underlying all these dualities. And I've said that many times, that I think that if we understand the answer to this question, we'll learn a lot about physics, both quantum field theory and string theory. We understand where these dualities come from, why they are there, how to prove them, and so forth. So I think that I should stop now. Well, are, are there any questions? Yeah. Ah, very interesting question. So with if n is odd, I cannot make it time reversal invariant. If n is even, I can make it time reversal invariant. But all the hard work has already been done with two. So because making the charge, say, four out of two is essentially gauging a Z2 subgroup of the magnetic symmetry. So because we, we exclude some fluxes. So this is something we can easily do on the two sides of the duality. So it will end up, still end up being the same free fermion chi coupled to some topological field theory. For charge two, the, two the free fermion and the topological field theory decouple. But for higher charges, they don't decouple. And that was worked out in the same paper. <coughs> it, no, no, it's more complicated. It's more complicated. But it's still just topological. It's a free fermion with a topological field theory, but they talk to each other. So non-abelian group, there is a huge structure with SUN, with fundamentals. Uh, so there's some discussion in the literature about SUN with U and UN with fundamentals, SUN and UN with adjoints, with fermions, and sometimes with bosons. Similarly, with SON and spin N, they differ in the global structure the, with vectors, and uh, an anti-symmetric tensor and symmetric tensors. People also did. SPN, and every one of these examples 
had some new surprising elements. No guarantee that there are others to find, but new dualities, new consistency conditions, etc. No, you can no, take anything. Two, I mean, what would be the generalization for so one generalization of that is SON with a symmetric tensor. So that's a general. Every one of these examples you can generalize in many different ways. You can also say it's UN with a two-index tensor. There are lots of generalizations. And whatever you do there should go over in the special case to this example I presented. Ofer is the, the local expert, so you should ask him. He knows more than I do about this. And he invented most of these. Well, if we have supersymmetry, we can. And personally, I always thought that the supersymmetric dualities are there, but supersymmetry is only, only helps us to establish them, but there should be something similar without supersymmetry. I spent a lot of time trying to find something similar in four dimensions. I didn't find anything. It took me many years to realize that the place to work is not in four, but in three. And then there's this structure. <laughs> but I haven't given up. And I, I, well, this is the same question that David asked me. Are there such dualities in four dimensions which are not supersymmetric? Are there non-supersymmetric dualities in four dimensions? My hunch is that the answer is yes. I don't see why not. But I don't have anything useful to say about this. Which is good, because there's so many young people in the audience, there's a lot to work on. So. I think it will be quite interesting if you, f you find an example. And if you find one example, I bet there will be tons of them. Because once you have one example, we know how to turn the crank and create others. Yeah. And there are general lessons in all these dualities. Go after the symmetries, being very careful. Commute, don't commute, and so forth. Go after the anomalies. Check the line operators, at Wilson lines, at Hooft lines, magnetic charges. All these things are going to be crucial in the story. Yeah, let's thank uh, Eliezer again. You know, Eliezer has been lecturing here for. Eliezer is not. <laughs> but no, Nari has been lecturing here for 33 years. Did you know that? Uh, since last night when Eliezer computed <laughs> it. <laughs> but it's clear from this talk and the others and, and the, the last remarks. There are probably 33 more years of the first So that's like it. Nadi again. Thank you. And uh, since we're getting towards the end and people are disappearing, I wanted to thank the relevant people in the, uh, at the appropriate time. Uh, of course, Eliezer and I did something in organizing the school, but that's not the most important thing. The most important thing.